Spotlight is proudly sponsored by HEC Media, St. Louis's home for arts, education, and culture. The Freedom Riders wanted to show that you're not alone. I love the adventure of developing and refining a work. They don't know they're learning. They think they're having fun. It feels like a game. Today on Spotlight, behind the scenes at the St. Louis Blues game, meet the director of Blue Note Productions. Plus, the program for short-term courses in biotechnology. And then, new art exhibits to explore in Clayton, including paintings with clothing displayed on them. But first, a book made into a movie, made into a foundation. It's Sunday and you're watching the multiple Emmy Award winning Spotlight. In 1994, first-year teacher Aaron Gruel's 150 high school students had already been labeled as unteachable. Aaron chose an abrupt shift from the traditional curriculum and handed out copies of the Diary of Anne Frank. She encouraged her students to record their own experiences, fears, and dreams in personal essays. All 150 students would graduate four years later, and their writing was collected in The Freedom Writer's Diary an international bestseller, and the basis for the feature film, The Freedom Riders, starring Hilary Swank. My name is Erin Guell. Today, Erin runs The Freedom Riders Foundation, which aims to help teachers engage, enlighten, and empower at-risk students to reach their full potential. In Dear Freedom Rider, Erin introduces a new generation of Freedom Riders, the book includes 50 letters from young people around the world on topics ranging from racism and poverty to mental health. For today's conversation, Erin was joined by Narada Comins, one of the original Freedom Riders, and Dr. Paula D. Knight, Superintendent of Schools for the Jennings School District. Our name, Freedom Writer, is, is truly an homage of the civil rights advocates, writers, R-I-D-E-R, -E who following in the footsteps of a uh, former Congressman John Lewis, who, yes. who rode those buses, um, crossed that bridge in Selma and, and fought for equity and, and equality in our, in our classrooms. Yes. So as teenagers, when the original Freedom Riders learned about the Freedom Riders from the 60s, mm -hmm. we, we realized these are really big shoes to fill because Freedom Riders are activists yes. and they do something. They stand up they speak up and ultimately speak out. So in writing their truth in the Freedom Riders Diary all those years ago, also came this feeling of, of activism and whether they were accidental activists or accidentally on purpose, uh, the Freedom Riders spent the last two decades working with educators and, and working with kids to face fears, to tell truths and, and hopefully and ultimately share stories. And so this new book, Dear, Dear Freedom Writer, was a wellspring at a time when people were in, indoors and, and scared and, and tentative about what was going to happen next. The, the Freedom Writers wanted to show that you're not alone and it's better. And there's someone just like you who made it out the other side. And that's the beauty of this book is every curated letter had the ability to find a freedom writer who said, I've been there, mm -hmm. I've done that, and look at me now. I'm gonna change the narrative. I'm, I'm not a victim, I'm a survivor. So Narada, what, talk to us about your experience. As a teacher, I always wanna know about lessons learned. Just the humanity lessons uh, within it. I think we've all become more well-rounded people by the experiences that we were able to, to have just by uh, writing a story, writing a book, and having somebody like Aaron, uh, Ms. Gruel, to believe in us when everybody else kind of didn't, and they kind of just put us in this box and, and just thought, oh, well, we're just another bunch of kids, but she had other ideas, 
and she kind of unlocked our true potential. Here we are today. To find out why Erin Gruel still writes letters to her father who passed away and how she models to her students what she asks of them, watch the full interview at HECmedia.org. Scan the QR code on your screen to follow us on Facebook, Twitter, or Instagram. When you go to a professional hockey game, of course the main attraction is the players on the ice. But part of the fun of actually being live inside the arena is all the lights, music, bells, and whistles. And when you go to a St. Louis Blues game, the master of ceremonies running the show and overseeing all that is whistle. Eric Siders. My primary position is game entertainment producer. I write the scripts for all of our home games. I um, kind of work with all of the departments in our organization, uh, determine what we're going to do on that particular night, what promos we're going to run, what um, you know, games and things like that we're going to do. To be clear, the game itself is live and Although some fans might like to have a predetermined outcome, Eric does not have any control over which teams win or lose. What we provide is more of the entertainment surrounding the game. So, um, you know, music and videos and the promos, um, you know, puck shuffle, things like that, uh, the intermission content, um, the bands, things like that. That's what we script and um, kind of what we put on the entertainment outside of the actual game. We really start before the players come out to kind of set the scene, uh, set the mood. We have fans who come in who show up right when doors open, so we want to provide some entertainment for them uh, while they're waiting for warm-ups to start. Uh, once warm-ups start, we provide the music and um, you know show the player shots, fan shots, show the signs that are up on the glass, all kinds of uh, kids and things like that, uh, some of the storylines stats, things like that that we'll do during warm-ups. A feel for the game as far as like when the game actually starts, you get a feel for how the team is doing and if we need a little bit of pumping up, if we need to just celebrate, celebrate the team's playing well and, and just continue the celebration. Eric oversees all that from a seat all alone near the top of the arena. But in order to make it happen, he's in constant communication with a whole bunch of other people all helping execute those calls. This is the control room. This is where uh, everything happens on a, on a game night. We have a director over in the corner. Uh, we have our, our TD slot. We have our playback operation, you know, graphics, things like that. We have two replay operators and then a robo camera. We have also a couple handheld cameras and also uh, what one tight camera. I always tell people it's kind of like steering a ship and steering like a, a big ocean liner, right? So there's a lot of people involved. Uh, everyone's very talented and I'm just kind of telling them where we're gonna head and trying to steer that ship in that direction. I'm watching the game and also just keeping our script up to date and letting people know what's coming up. One thing that we always like to say is if, if even if the team isn't performing well, people are still here to have a good time. HEC Media, recognized, celebrated, honored time and again for excellence in the industry. HEC Media has been bringing home the hardware for over a decade. Arts and education to author talks, magazine shows and documentaries, individual craft achievements to overall excellence. Find all of the award-winning content at hecmedia.org. Gene Mitchell Carr is getting an edge in St. Louis's growing biotechnology industry by completing a five-day course. It was pretty awesome because we got a chance to really put our hands on our bioreactors, learning that process. I mean, I've seen it executed in a very large scale in a production environment to be able to do this. It was pretty exciting. I enjoyed it tremendously. The five-day focus is on bioreactors, where a biologic reaction is carried out. Gene's employer, Thermo Fisher Scientific, uses bioreactors for drug development and production. 
The purpose for being here today is to increase my knowledge base. I'm an Ops Specialist training in the training department. As a training specialist at the site, we try to assist our manufacturing colleagues who are producing bulk drug substances to assist them with doing their job well simplify some of the learning and the training process so it becomes a little bit easier for our new hires coming in. Thermo Fisher Scientific in St. Louis helped develop the curriculum for a workforce development partnership with BioSTL and St. Louis Community College. We have to take this part off. For Thermo Fisher Scientific, the partnership is an opportunity to develop local talent. The company says it needs a technically trained workforce for the production of biologic drug substance products. The drugs treat chronic health conditions, including cancers and other life-threatening diseases, including COVID-19. The new biotechnology certification courses cover a variety of subjects. They are designed to fuel local talent to support the growth of St. Louis bioscience companies. Companies. We all learn differently and for me I like to call myself a hybrid learner. I can listen to a lecture but for me to be able to grasp the concept I'd like to be kinesthetic which is a nice fancy term for putting your hands on it and getting your hands a little dirty so you learn how the process truly works. So my mindset is you can't teach what you don't know. You can't lead where you don't go. So if I am learning this process, I can impart that information to a newer colleague who may be a new dog and I'm an old dog teaching a new dog new tricks. Other Thermo Fisher scientific employees in the class are there for other reasons. So I'm a QA manager for Thermo Fisher. Getting to learn all the steps of bioprocessing. It'll help me understand. So if I'm reading an investigation, or uh, get a call from operations and they let me know uh, they had a problem, I'll be able to process that easier and kind of understand the process. For more information, go to our website, hecmedia.org. Jazz from the legendary Jeannie Trevor, later on Spotlight. So here we are at Bruno David Gary in St. Louis on Forsyth Boulevard, downtown Clayton. and. Uh, we're showing uh, several artists, Cindy Tar, her works, what we call the combined paintings. And that means it combines different elements into the paintings. As a painter, my personal goal was to try to make paintings without paint. And um, I have also been very upset about the refuse of our culture. And clothing creates a big footprint of refuse. So I wanted to take things that were being thrown out and make art out of it, as I've done throughout my entire career. In painting, it's really fun to use old clothes because clothing comes in all different textures and styles. Like painting a night sky with blue velvet is very different than any effect you can get with oil paint. And when you find an old coat that's plaid, it looks like a trestle bridge. So it becomes a bridge in the landscape, and that's been the fun, because if I could make a painting out of clothing where the viewer at first does not recognize the clothing, but then has to use their own imagination to see the clothes that they themselves wore once, it becomes more fun, you know? I really tried to use no oil paint, but I failed in the sense that all the paintings have paint still. I have yet to make a painting without any oil paint, but I'm trying, and that's been my fun. Chris Kaler's show right now, it's a very small works on paper. What happened in this particular exhibition is that these small works on paper forced me to kind of rethink how I wanted to approach it. I typically work just in acrylic and I typically work at a larger scale. So back in early 2000s, I started working on panel and doing a lot of works dealing with surfaces. But what's interesting is I actually came from like a background of watercolors. And I think that comes from my mother is a watercolor artist and my father is an architect. So I kind of have these two kind of polar opposites that kind of collide uh, in me as a person and as an artist. So I approached these works in a very different and unique way. I kind of started that kind of surface 
I started doing some of the acrylic painting on top of that, and then I decided I had these fragments left over from all my old panel paintings. And this body of work, for some reason, it triggered a response where I said, I could collage these into these paintings. So in many ways, these works are almost like a 20 year survey of my work. It's taking all these different things that I was doing over the last 20 years, combining them all into one kind of uh, content in terms of what this show's doing. And William Congard, he's from Chicago, and he's really an artist with a, a very long established uh, studio practice. I'm very pleased to be having my second solo show at Bruno David Gallery, and I'm showing uh, newer abstract paintings completed over the past year and a half or so, and these continue the work that I've been doing for a long, long time. My past work has been much larger, but over the past few years I've decided to start doing smaller works, which uh, somehow uh, did present a problem at first because of the compositional challenge to make a work complex enough and interesting enough that even on a small scale it would uh, hold its space and yet not try to overcome uh, and demand to be larger than it really is. So I like the intimacy of the small works. I love the adventure of developing and refining a work bit by bit. I change the color a lot. I think of myself like a orchestra director and uh, bringing up this sound and reducing that sound and only I'm doing it with color and tone. Uh, but it's the same kind of organization. I'm really the director of this composition, but I want it to do the playing. We are very excited to show these three artists, and uh, we're showing also three more artists besides those three. The show will run until June 26th, and for more information, you can go to brunodavidgallery.com. You just never know where that spark is going to come from. You're putting a human touch to everything through the vehicle of art. We give them the ability to hope. Once upon a time, there were a community of wolves, and they were eating grass. Oh no, what are we going to do? Our water is going down. We need water to survive. And then everyone was saying, Alpha Pinky, what do we do? These stories are brought to you by Springboard to Learning. Our focus has been, as a nonprofit, to really work with kids, particularly under-resourced kids in the schools, uh, to ignite their love of learning. And we do that through visual art, performing arts, design thinking, dance, music, all those different artistic venues to bring the curriculum to life in the classroom. What's the most important part of a story? Imagination! And these students at Brown Elementary are full of imagination as they participate in Springboard's storytelling initiative. To add even more fun to the process, it was PJ Day. I liked that it was for us to use our imaginations and that we could go let our minds wild. My story is about sea turtles and they were losing their water. I have a lot of creativity, so I, my creativity just thought of it. What we believe is that meaningful, memorable learning experiences transform a child's worldview. And it is that belief that really fuels our mission to develop children's abilities to think critically, create, collaborate, and communicate. The learning isn't always just about paper and pencil activities. So having these outside presenters come in is a great way to get the kids exposed to fun, enjoyable, engaging learning. They don't know they're learning. They think they're having fun. It feels like a game. Act out what they have to do to solve their problem. Storytelling engages not just their attention, but their imagination. But one day, there was a hurricane and everybody was screaming, Ah, what do we do? But at the same time, we are addressing the entire narrative protocol that's set out in the Missouri ELA standards. I want you to think of two adjectives, two words that describe you. Like, 
my prairie dogs were dusty and brown. Because they embed those standards in to the performances as well as the residencies, the teachers don't feel like that it's taken up their instructional time. I learned that you can write a story however you want, and a story is, and every single story has a problem, and stories need to be like really intricate and detailed. I learned that um, when you do sound effects, it, it makes the um, story m um, better and more um, not boring. The fun part about writing it is when is when I roll all the voices. And knees and shoulders, head, shoulders, head. Springboard to Learning has been educating students with their inventive, artistic programs for over 110 years, with elementary and middle school programs available for booking in schools and community venues throughout the St. Louis metropolitan area. To me, arts integration is the most powerful way to teach. But arts integration isn't something that most schools know about. You did it. And so teaching artists through Springboard can be brought together with the schools to not only work with the kids, but really at the same time, we're demonstrating for teachers strategies that they can use that work with their kids. This program really brought out collaboration, working together with other classmates, being creative, working on just personal skills. I am hungry. No, 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 no. The most fun was when we presented it because um, I had a crowd in front of me and they always clapped when I finished or started. It made me feel like they was actually there to support me. What I liked about the story that you, that you put the details and the actions in it. It's a great opportunity for teachers actually to have some professional development. They're in the class, they see what works, they see their kids responding in ways they have never seen before. I have well, at least 45 students are like shy, but just seeing them participate, volunteering to act out their stories, I mean, I think it brought out their personality more and just built self-esteem. Collaboration, creativity, and education is Springboard's secret to success. We envision a day where all children are passionate, engaged learners who experience success. G-O-O-D-J-O-B. Good job, good job. Boom, give yourselves a hand. School is wrapping up for the year, but Springboard to Learning's fun doesn't take a vacation. Saturday, June 11th, they will be hosting a night of jazz at the Two Hill Performing Arts Center. Proceeds from the concert will directly benefit the children who participate in the Springboard to Learning program. Tickets and more info can be found at springboardstl.org slash jazz. The concert will feature several musicians, including jazz vocalists, and UMSL alumni Carla Harris and St. Louis's own First Lady of Jazz, Jeannie Trevor. HEC Media caught up with Jeannie Trevor a while back. Here's her story. If I stop singing, oh, that might be the end of me. I've got to sing, I've got to sing. Yes, and I'm not good. For over five decades, Jeannie Trevor has been entertaining music lovers in St. Louis. Although she calls the Gateway City home, her musical roots began at amateur night at the famed Apollo Theater in Harlem, where she grew up. A big, big name spot, and it was only on a, at the end of the regular show, which meant you came on about midnight or something. And if you didn't make it, this guy would come out in a funny thing with a water pistol and shoot you off. Her entire family was gifted musically. Her mother loved to dance, and her brothers and sister all sang just like their father. Jeannie thought Hollywood would offer more opportunities. She spent four years in Los Angeles, but struggled to book gigs. It was a cousin who convinced her to give St. Louis a try. It was the early 1960s, and he described a hip and happening arts and music scene in an area called Gaslight Square. The veteran vocalist has been a fixture on the St. Louis jazz scene ever since. She recalls a memorable visit from the late actor Vincent Price, a St. Louis native. He came to one of the nightclubs that I sang at, the Black Horse. And I was sitting at the bar on my break and someone said, that's the singer that you were listening to. And he came over and he was so nice, so gracious. What my heart is hurt takes my breath away. Her 
influences include Dinah Washington, Nancy Wilson, Billie Holiday, and Ella Fitzgerald. My background was theater, and I wanted to be an opera singer, but you had to go to Europe if you were black. In 1967, her voice was heard on St. Louis radio, but not for her singing. She became a DJ at the former KADI radio on the FM dial. I spawned records of jazz people. You just name them, you know, I was hip at that time. Fish gotta swim, birds gotta Walls in Showboat, Kiss Me Kate, and Les Miserables at the Muni Opera came in her later years. Cause I can't help loving that man of mine. That's why I like the Muni, too. It was an opera as grand opera, but it was still, it's still opera. It's stories and it's beautiful music. So that was a dream come true there. She even performed with Baseball Hall of Famer Ozzy Smith in The Muni Goes British. Jenny, you know, was one of the, um, the, the peop one of the people that had all of the experience. And she made it so, so easy. She made you feel such a part and so relaxed. So you try and um, learn from people like that and how they're able to, to take a moment and, and turn it into something special. She cut her first album in 1965 called Jeannie Trevor Sings. Much to her chagrin, they didn't use her photo and they misspelled her name. It was another 33 years before she cut her second album and her first CD. You're listening to the wonderful Dave Ventrio. These are my friends from Gaslight Square. We get along great musically because I know where she's going, she knows where I'm going. Trevor has reunited with keyboardist Dave Venn and drummer Henry Etman. We've all kind of had our separate paths, but then when we come back together, it feels like, you know, it's like an old coat that you put back on, it just fits and feels really good. They've performed with each other off and on for 60 years, ever since the heyday of Gaslight Square. Part of the jazz vernacular is you have to go with the flow, so that's what we do with Jeannie. If she goes one place, we just go with her. The longtime crooner has been honored with a Lifetime Achievement Award from the Grand Center for her contribution to St. Louis arts and culture. The versatile singer doesn't categorize herself as a jazz performer. She prefers to describe herself as a modern American singer and has no problem detouring into cabaret, gospel, or even Latin music. But she's still the local queen of scat. You must take the A train. You get to Sugar Hill in Harlem. And if you want to scat that same melody, you go, you do 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 so do 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 so do 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 so do 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 Next week, after a couple of challenging years for the arts community, the Regional Arts Commission funding is back. Plus, why this endangered exotic cow is wearing a Fitbit. Thanks for watching Spotlight. Join us next Sunday at 9.30 a.m. on KPLR 11.